My voice is still not fully recovered, so I apologize. My voice might be more monotone than usual, uh, but I have a bit of a sore throat. Uh, so, inshallah, we were still talking about the Battle of Tabuk. And as I said, the Battle of Tabuk is so many lessons and there is no battle. We're just talking about various things here and there around and so many incidents. And today we will continue talking about a number of incidents that took place uh, during the Battle of Tabuk. Now, realize we haven't even left Medina yet. Like for the last three weeks or four weeks when we're doing the Battle of Tabuk, we haven't actually left Medina. We're talking about things that happen in Medina. So today, let us, alhamdulillah, depart from Medina. And then we're going to spend a few more lessons going back and forth in, in what happened in the journey. Now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he left behind Muhammad ibn Maslama as the person in charge of the affairs of Medina. So uh, whenever he would leave, he would appoint a, uh, a person in charge, obviously, to run the affairs. And he told Ali ibn Abi Talib that you must stay behind, you will take charge of my family. Because Ali is his son-in-law. So Ali ibn Abi Talib is the person that will manage the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the, uh, the, his immediate family, because after all, this journey is going to take more than a month and a half, almost two months, the whole journey, and somebody has to take care of the uh, household affairs. So the Prophet told Ali ibn Abi Talib, you will stay behind to protect my family, to take care of their needs and whatnot. And when the Prophet said this, the Munafiqun began mocking Ali ibn Abi Talib, that he is a burden, he's not worthy of fighting, that the Prophet doesn't want him to come because he's not a capable warrior, so he just made this excuse to uh, let him remain behind. And of course, Ali is well known for his bravery, his courage, his fighting prowess, and he is a young man, and this type of taunting really affected him. And so he put on his armor, and he put on his, he put, he took his sword in his hand, and he caught up with the army of the Prophet ﷺ when they were outside the city. He caught up with them and he said, Ya Rasulullah, are you leaving me with the women and children while the munafiqun are mocking me? And they're saying that, you know, you have only left me behind because you don't think, because I'm not qualified to be fighting in the battlefield. So Ali really felt it's so embarrassing to remain behind with the women and children when everybody is out in the battlefield. So he tried to have one more opportunity to beg the Prophet ﷺ to let him go. And SubhanAllah, this is the real Iman, that the, the people of Iman wanted to go. So much so they're crying to go. And the Munafiqun are mocking them. The Munafiqun are mocking Ali. They're the ones remaining behind with false excuses. And they have the audacity to accuse Ali and the others of cowardice, right? And this is the reality of the Munafiqun to this day that they accuse their, the, the other people of the crimes that they themselves are guilty of. So the Prophet ﷺ consoled Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said, are you not content to be with me like Harun was with Musa? This is a very famous hadith that is used by especially the Shia group. So we need to really just pause a few minutes to under explain this, right? Are you not content? And these are in our so authentic hadith, it's in our Sunni traditions as well. Are you not content, Ya Ali? Me mean, who cares what the Munafiqun are saying? Are you not happy that our relationship is like the relationship of Harun and Musa, except that there is no Nabi after me. So don't take it like the Harun and Musa literally, because Harun was the prophet after Musa. There is no Nabi after me. But you have that close bondness, and the, the, the bond that I have with Harun, that I have with you. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, they, the Munafiqun, are liars, for I have only left you to be in charge of those whom I have left behind, meaning my family. So don't worry about them. I have left you in charge to be uh, of uh, in charge of my family. Now, uh, this is one of the main evidences that is used by uh, the, the the Shia to say that Ali was intended to be the Khalifa after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we as Sunni Muslims, we affirm every single blessing for Ali, including this one. But we also take into account all the other evidences and. This narration does not suggest that Ali was indicated to become the next Khalifa. Rather, even in this incident, Ali was not left in charge of the city. Rather, Muhammad ibn Maslama was left in charge of the city. And Ali was chosen because he is within. We, we all affirm, Sunni and Shia, that Ali is of the Al-Bayt. We all affirm. 
Who is going to take care of the Al Bayt, the stranger? Of course not. A son-in-law, somebody that is well aware of you know, the family circumstances, somebody who's married to the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu And that is exactly what our Prophet himself said. I am leaving you to take charge of those whom I have left behind, meaning my family. And therefore, even the context of the narration does not indicate that what this relationship of Harun and Musa is, is the relationship of political authority. The hadith indicates the closeness. That's how close I am to you. Just like Musa and Harun were so close together, they were almost like brothers. I'm sorry, they were like brothers, excuse me. We are almost like brothers. That's the point here. That as close as they two were, so too are we. And that is definitely a blessing and a fadilah that we affirm to Ali ibn Abi Talib. But that does not mean that the Prophet was indicating that he should be the Khalifa after me. And there are many evidences that we will come to, inshallah, when we come to it, of the Prophet as explicitly as possible indicating that Abu Bakr was supposed to be the next Khalifa after him. In any case, so uh, the process continued going until he reached a very famous place of Medina that all of you have heard of but none of you are aware of. All of you have heard the name but very few of you are even aware it is a place. And this is the place of Thaniyyatul Wada'a. Thaniyyatul Wada'a. All of you, every one of you has heard of this location. This is the place. Now, what is Thaniyatul Wada'a? Thaniyatul Wada'a. Thaniya is a hill, is a mound. And Wada'a means goodbye. And north of Medina, uh, north northeast of Medina, North of the Haram, I should say, the Masjid al-Nabawi, northerly direction, uh, there was a small mound that the people who, the family members of any caravan that was going up north would walk with the caravan to wave goodbye, to hug, to, you know, uh, give the best wishes until they all climbed up to Thaniyat al-Wada'a. Then the family would remain and the others would go on and the people would wave goodbye. Thaniyatul Wada, the mound of waving goodbye. That's what Thaniyatul Wada means, okay? So they went to Thaniyatul Wada. And by the way, I'll jump the gun here uh, and tell you a very sad reality. The famous poem that we all love and rejoice and whatnot, it is not a poem that occurred at the Hijrah. In fact, it is geographically impossible and even content-wise, it is impossible that it occurred at the Hijrah. Because when the Prophet emigrated, the majority of Medina was not even Muslim. Right? And when he emigrated, which direction is he coming from? Oh, south. south. Right? So, we'll come to this. I kind of jumped the, the gun, but now that we're talking about it, the poem of Tala al Badru alayna, where did this happen and when did it happen? When the Prophet came back from Tabuk. This is when it happened. And they went out to Thaniyat al-Wada'a. Tala al-Badru alayna min Thaniyat al-Wada'a. So the Badr is coming up. The Prophet is now rising from the Thaniyat al-Wada'a. Right? Wajaba shukru alayna. So now they're all Muslims and now they are rejoicing the return of the Prophet in Thaniyat al-Wada'a. So after the Prophet passed by Thaniyat al-Wada'a in the northern part of the city, then he paused the camp. And he rearranged all of the troops. We already mentioned that uh, the number of the people participating in Tabuk is something that is a guesstimate. Nobody counted. And some books say 30,000 of, uh, of early Islam. So it just stuck. And I said I am somewhat skeptical of this high figure. But even if it's 15,000, it is a large number. It is the largest number ever that went out. So the Prophet ﷺ paused here and reorganized. He assigned battalions, he assigned leaders to the subdivisions, and this demonstrates, as usual, the extreme competence of the process and the organizational skills, the management skills, even though he never trained in, 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 in a military academy, yet, subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa obviously gave him this knowledge, and he assigned each battalion a leader, each one had a flag, like military um, commanders do. And Al-Waqidi in his Maghazi, uh, the famous book, he goes into pages of details of which tribe had which leader, and that's not going to be of much benefit to us at this level. But do realize that, uh, as usual, our process divided them based upon their tribes. And again and again, I bring this point up because 
uh, to bring it, make it relevant and whatnot, to make it useful in that, subhanAllah, no doubt our religion came to eliminate partisanship and, and whatnot. Yet, it is human nature that birds of a feather flock together. That people of one ethnicity, people of one region, people of one language, they'll have some affinity. And Islam does not obliterate those ties. And that's why even in battle, it is convenient to have the people that you know and the people you feel most comfortable in your small group. And in our case, for example, the issues of the nation state, uh, that there's nothing wrong with affirming certain ties with the nation state, uh, your nationality. Uh, if you're in a strange land and you meet somebody from your city, from your village, from your town, from your country, you feel an affinity that is based on nothing other than your nationality. And there's nothing wrong with this. And I say this because, again, we have these extremist elements, as usual, they deny these things. And there's nothing wrong with it if it is kept in a healthy check. So the Prophet ﷺ then departed out. And uh, on the journey, a number of things happened. Today, we'll mention one or two. And inshallah, in the future classes, we will uh, continue. And uh, one of the things that happened is actually narrated in the books of hadith. So today I actually brought the book of hadith with me because it's a very beautiful hadith. I found it to be very beneficial. This is a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. Uh, and I told you the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Ahmad is a very large book. It is the largest compilation of hadith that is present in our times. And it is now published in 50 volumes. So this is volume number 36 of Musnad Imam Ahmad, hadith number 22,122. Uh, and it is a beautiful narration. Now again, the incident of Tabuk, it has miscellaneous incidents like this. So today's hadith, this one, the first one, it's just an incident that took place and it's very beautiful. So we just want to pause here, talk about this hadith, and then move on to another hadith. As I said, it's not like one battle like Badr or like Uhud. It's just lots of small things. So this hadith goes back to uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an, that Imam Ahmad narrates from Abu Nadr, from Abdul Hamid, from Shahar, from Ibn, Ghan, uh, Ibn Ghunmin, from Ab uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And we all know Mu'adh ibn Jabal. That Mu'adh ibn Jabal narrated. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out towards Tabuk in the battle of Tabuk, that... After he had prayed Fajr with the people on the way to Tabuk, one day he's praying Fajr. So the people then went back on their camels. And when the sun began to rise up, the people began falling asleep on their mounts. So they're getting sleepy. They must have had a long night. And even though they're on the camels, but the people are getting uh, sleepy. And Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala said that he's following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But as the people fell asleep, their camels began splitting up here and there. And uh, Mu'adh tried to keep up with the camel of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Mu'adh's camel uh, almost tripped. So Mu'adh said that, I jerked it back, you know, with the reins. I jerked the camel uh, back. And it went up on its behind, you know, the, how the, the, they rear forward, and it scared the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it scared the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ran forward. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wearing his turban around his face. So he took it off and he looked that, who has done this? Right, so who has irritated the camel? And he saw me, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So the Prophet said, Ya Mu'adh. So Mu'adh said, Labbayka ya Nabi Allah. And uh, the Prophet said, Udnu duna, come here. So Mu'adh said, I came close to him until our saddles were touching one another. SubhanAllah, right? This is a simple, beautiful hadith, just like vivid detail that. In the middle of the desert, there are now walking. Mu'ad is on his camel. The Prophet is on his camel. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, uh, I didn't realize that the people are so separated from us. Because everyone is here and there. So Mu'ad said, Ya Nabi Allah, the people became sleepy 
and their camels took them helter skelter. So when you're sleeping on the camel, the camel is more interested in food than following a straight path. And it's no big deal, they're all wandering. You know, I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, uh, how it would have been for many days of walking. Allah knows what day this is, maybe the 15th day. Allahu alam, everybody's tired, they're on the way to Tabuk. So the people are just tired after Fajr, and some of them are asleep, the camels are here and there. So the Prophet is saying, I, don't, I didn't realize the people are so far away. Mu'adh makes an excuse. Ya Rasulullah, they fell asleep, they got tired on their. Uh, camels. So the Prophet uh, so the Prophet ﷺ said, and I too was sleeping. And when you did this, I too was sleeping. So he too was sleeping on the camel. So then Mu'ad said, when I saw that I am so close to the Prophet ﷺ, and there's nobody else except the two of us, subhanAllah. How like they are waiting for this opportunity. They want to be just with the Prophet ﷺ. I said, Ya Rasulullah, Give me permission to ask you something. SubhanAllah. I mean, it's so much adab, right? So much manners that he is all alone with him. And they are on a long journey. And he's so happy that Mu'ad is saying, I finally have some private time with the Prophet So he's asking permission. Ya Rasulullah, give me, an, can I ask a question for you? And this question has caused me to think and ponder until I felt sick thinking about it. What a, what a beautiful hadith here, right? You see why I went into this tangent, because wallahi, it's such a powerful hadith, and I have given an entire khatira just on this hadith in, in uh, other places. It's a beautiful hadith, but now we link it to Tabuk, because it happened during Tabuk. So the Prophet said, Sal Ammashir, ask whatever you want. Go ahead and ask. So he said, Ya Nabi Allah, Hadithni bi amalin yudkhilun jannata la as'aluk an shay'in ghayrahu. What a beautiful hadith. Tell me what I can do to enter Jannah. Something that only you can tell me. I don't have to ask anybody else. So Mu'adh is saying, Ya Rasulullah, I have a question. Thinking about it made me fall sick. I'm thinking and thinking and thinking and it's driving me crazy. I'm going crazy, literally that's what he's saying. I want to know the answer. What do I need to do to enter Jannah? SubhanAllah. This is the question he has. That... What, is the, what do I need to do to get to Jannah? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Bakhin, Bakh, Bakhin, Bakh. And this is not translatable into English, but it's an f- expression that uh, is used to indicate good fortune. Like, uh, I, I don't even know any English equivalent, I don't know. But it's like great or what a noble thing. Uh, it is used to indicate like expression of ta'ajjub, like amazement, like maybe something like. Something like wow, but I mean that's not even the meaning here. But it doesn't really, it's not translatable. That the Prophet is praising Mu'adh ibn Jabal for what a great question. Bakhin bakh, bakhin bakh, laqad sa'alta bi'azim. You have asked a great matter. You have asked a great matter. You have asked a great matter. So he repeated that three times. And uh, uh, and he said, وَإِنَّهُ لَيَسِيرٌ عَلَى مَنْ أَرَادَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِهِ الْخَيْرِ And it is an easy thing if Allah wants good for you. And he repeated that three times as well. And Mu'ad said, he would always repeat the important things three times. So he said to him, you've asked a, a big question. And he said that three times. Then he said, but it is an easy answer for whomever Allah wants to make it easy. And he repeated that three times. Okay. So then he said, that the Prophet ﷺ said that how can you enter Jannah? تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ You believe in Allah and the last day. وَتُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ And you offer the salah. This goes back to our yesterday's lecture by the way. About salah being a part of la ilaha illallah. And you offer your salah. And you worship Allah alone. And you do this until you die upon this. That you believe in Allah and the Yawm Al-Akhir. And you are praying your prayers. And you do not worship any but Allah. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, O Messenger of Allah, repeat this for me. So he repeated it uh, again. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, If you want, O Mu'adh, then I will uh, inform you about رأس هذا الأمر وقوام هذا الأمر وذروة السنام. I will tell you about the head of this matter. Now the head means, of course, the most important part. وقوام means the pillar, the backbone. وذروة السنام. And dirwatu sina means the pinnacle. So there's a head, there is a 
backbone, and then there is the jewel at the top, the crowns at the top, let's say, right? So this is what the Prophet is saying. What is the what is the, the crux of the matter? What is the backbone or the gist? And what is the, the jewel at the top? He's saying these three things. So the uh, Mu'adh ibn Shabal said, Yes, of course, may my mother and father be given in your ransom. Bi abi anta wa ummi, ya Rasulullah. And this is how they would address our Prophet Sallallahu that I will give my mother and father in ransom for you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna ra'sa hadha al-amr. The, the head of all of this, meaning by, by head means what? The most important thing. Right, the head is what the most important thing. The ra'as of this matter is an tashhada Allah ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. That's really what the head of Islam is. The shahada, simple enough. Okay, the qiwam, the backbone of this whole matter is iqam al-salah wa ita al-zakah, praying and giving zakah. This is the backbone, the qiwam. Wa dhirwatu sanam. And the jewels, the crown jewels, the head, that is really the, the pinnacle, is al jihadu fi sabilillah. And remember, they are on jihad fi sabilillah right now. They're going to Tabuk. And they did not know what's going to meet them there. They're expecting a Roman army. They're expecting a large group. So there's no doubt this hadith is very pertinent in the battle of uh, Tabuk. And, uh, uh, and there was a... Uh, and then he said, وَإِنَّمْ And I have been commanded to do qital of the people until they establish the salah and they give the zakah and they testify, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And if they do that, then their lives and properties are uh, protected in the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this hadith, of course, is the famous hadith of I have been commanded to do qital to the people. And this hadith has been commonly misinterpreted by many of the Islamophobes today uh, to imply that our religion is all about devastation and destruction. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us why is he going to Tabuk? Allah has commanded me to fight these people. And uh, when, he see, when he says, An-Nas, so this means the people in the context of what he is talking about. And that is why the majority of scholars have held the view that you can, uh, that the Islamic State is not obliged to be waging war against everybody until the Day of Judgment. And that's why, historically speaking, the Abbasis, the Umayyads, the Ottomans, they had boundaries. And they weren't always at war with everybody outside of those boundaries. So we need to understand this hadith in that light. And our Prophet uh, then goes on. That I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul. No face becomes tired. Nor does a foot become dusty in any deed that will raise it higher in Jannah. After the fard salah like jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So face becoming tired and the, uh, the feet becoming dusty. So and again, this is being said in the context of, of the battle of Tabuk, right? So this is an encouragement for a legitimate jihad fi sabidillah. And the Prophet ﷺ said that nothing makes the mizan, the scales heavier, uh, like spending money upon an animal that is in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or carrying people in the way of Allah. So this beautiful hadith, now you understand the hadith is, it happened in Tabuk, but it's not quite, you know, it's just an incident that happened that Mu'adh and the Prophet were alone. And so it's something beautiful to mention over here. So the Prophet continued uh, marching towards Tabuk. And he arrived in Tabuk. We don't have exact dates in the Sirah books for when he arrived and whatnot. But we know that he stayed in Tabuk for 20 days. He stayed in Tabuk for 20 days. And he prayed Qasr throughout all of this 20 days. And this issue is narrated in so many books of hadith that for all 20 days, he remained praying Qasr. Two raka'at. He never prayed the four uh, the full four raka'at for the fad prayers. And this, of course, led to a huge controversy in early Islam that how long can you remain muqeem at a location uh, and pray qasr? And the majority of scholars and all of the four madhahib scholars, so the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, they all said this hadith only applies to the state of war. You cannot extrapolate from this hadith 20 days. And it is only legitimate when you do not know how many days you will remain at a location. When the enemy might attack at any time. Then you may do Qasr for 20 days or for 6 months. If you're literally on the battlefield and you don't know when you're going to come back 
or when the enemy will attack, then there is no time limit. Because every day is uncertain. So the majority of scholars said this narration is irrelevant to the Musafir who's going to New York or London or Toronto or Timbuktu and staying there for five days or, and he knows he's staying for five days. You cannot apply this hadith. You understand why? You understand? or It's a state of war so you don't know how long. Every day you wake up and you don't know. Or is the enemy going to attack or not? Uh, and this is the form of that. Other schools, uh, there are, by the way, more than four schools of law, and there were more scholars than just the four scholars. So other scholars, they said, no, this indicates that you may remain up to 20 days as a musafir. If you remain at a place for 20 days, then you may do qasr. And this is an opinion that some of the scholars held that are outside of the form of thahib, right? And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they held the view that there is no time limit for how long you remain as a traveler, as long as you are a legitimate traveler. It depends on circumstance and not on time frame. And this is the opinion of uh, Al-Awza'i and uh, Ibn Qudama also seems to lean towards this, but Ibn Taymiyyah is the one who uh, would champion it. But the majority of scholars, they say that four days is uh, the time limit and the Hanafi say 15 days is the time limit. So Maliki, Shafi's and Hanbali say four days is the time limit. If you know you're gonna stay more than four days, or according to one have more than 21 salah. So don't count the days, count the number of salah. If you arrive after Fajr, start counting from Dhuhr and count 20 salah. If you stay 20 salah or less, you can do Qasr. And that's the Maliki Madhab. If you do, they count by salah. If you stay 20 salah or less, you do Qasr. If it's more than 20, you cannot do Qasr. Uh, and that's the Maliki Shafi Hanbali position. And the Hanafi position says, as all of us Hanafis know, uh, the Hanafi position says what? 15 days, half a month you may remain as a musafir and the fact or the correct opinion and Allah knows best is that there is no particular number of days. It rather goes back to your circumstance that if you are a genuine bona fide traveler and you know what is a traveler, you're living out of a suitcase, you're not in, you're in awkward circumstances, you don't have a, a maskan or a house, then it can prolong for five, six, seven days, no problem. And if you are not a traveler, then even if it's two days, if you go to your parents' house, let's say, and you're just there for two days and you are at home, this is your home, you feel at home, then even if it's two days, then you will not be considered a musafir. Or it is possible some rich people have two houses. They have a summer house or they have a, uh, some other house there. Some, uh, so uh, it is possible that you go to, you know, the vacation house. You can have that. So it is possible to have multiple houses. And if you go to another house and you feel that that is your house now, and you, uh, that is psychologically your house, then you're not going to do suffer there in any case. That's a fiqh issue here. The point is that uh, the Prophet ﷺ camped for 20 days. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it is reported in uh, one of the books of hadith, and that is the, uh, the book um, of... Dala'il uh, al-Nubu'a wal-Bayhaqi Dala'il al-Nubu'a wal-Bayhaqi He reported a khutbah that the Prophet ﷺ gave the morning that they arrived at Ghazwat Tabuk. And this khutbah is reported with a weak chain. So realize this is a hadith that is not fully authentic. But some wordings of it are reported in authentic chains. And the narration is very beautiful. And it gives us a glimpse into the Prophet's khutbahs, how eloquent. So I decided to actually read the entire khutbah for you. He gave a khutbah to the whole army the morning of Tabuk, when they first arrived at Tabuk. I reiterate the isnad or the chain of narrators, as is most of the seerah. I have said many times the seerah narrations are not as preserved as the laws of Islam. I've said this many times, right? So this is one of the seerah narrations. And therefore, there's no haraj, there's no harm in narrating it, but do realize that we don't derive our laws from this, but it gives us a glimpse. And by the way, some of the phrases of this hadith are authentic for sure. The hadith is very long, it's beautiful, many paragraphs. And some of them are authentic, but all put together, this is a khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ. So, uh, it is narrated by Uqba ibn, ibn Amir al-Juhani that when they arrived at Tabuk, they woke up and after the, they prayed the salah, they spent the night in Tabuk. After they prayed 
the Subh prayer, the Prophet stood up and praised Allah with what Allah deserves to be praised. And then he said, Ayyuhan nasu amma ba'd. And this is the sunnah of every single khutbah. You begin by praising Allah. You begin by some type of dhikr and hamd and thana. And then he would say, Amma ba'd. And this is to indicate that the praise is now over. Let me now get on to what I want to tell you. So Amma Ba'd is like a fasila, is like a marker between the introduction and the actual speech. فَإِنَّ أَصْدَقَ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ The most truthful of all speech is the book of Allah. وَأَوْثَقُ الْعُرَى كَلِمَةُ التَّقْوَى And the firmest handhold is the speech of taqwa. Now the kalimatu taqwa could mean la ilaha illallah and that is one meaning of kalimatu taqwa and it could also mean any righteous word any word that encourages people to be good is the firm handhold. Wa khayrul milali millatu Ibrahim the best of all paths and millas ways, tariqas is the path of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Allah says in the Quran wa tabi'u millata Ibrahim Hanifa. So the best milla is the milla of Ibrahim. Wa khayru sunani sunna to Muhammad in sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the best sunna is the sunna of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ashrafu al hadithi dhikrullah. Now notice, you already get a taste of the khutbah. Short, sweet, to the point. Every single phrase is profound. And this is the general khutbah of the Prophet. That Short, the whole khutbah lasted maybe three minutes if we did it in Arabic, right? But each word or each sentence is, in and of itself, you can give an entire lecture about, you know, the, the, the profundity of each of these phrases. So, the, the best hadith is the dhikrullah. The best thing you can say is the dhikr of Allah. وَأَحْسَنُ الْقَصَصِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ The best of all stories are those in the Quran. وَخَيْرُ الْأُمُورِ عَوَازِمُهَا وَشَرُّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا The best of all deeds are the ones that are done with the most sincere and the most dedication. And the worst of all deeds are those that are innovations. And the best guidance is the guidance of the prophets. And the best death is the death of a martyr. And the most blind of blindnesses is to be misguided after Allah has guided you. So once you are guided, how can you basically not be guided after that? And the best of deeds is that which benefits you in this world and the next. And the best knowledge is that which is followed. Now look, subhanAllah, each phrase here is just so beautiful, right? And the worst blindness, so the first phrase was the most blindness of the blind. This, the worst blindness is the blindness of the qalb. وَشَرُّ الْعَمَى عَمَى الْقَلْبِ The worst blindness is the blindness of the heart. And the higher hand is better than the lower hand. وَالْيَدُ الْعُلْيَا خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الْيَدِ السُّفْلَى And of course this is a beautiful metaphor, kinaya in Arabic, that the hand that gives money is better than the hand that receives money. وَالْيَدُ الْعُلْيَا خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الْيَدِ السُّفْلَى وَمَا قَلَّ وَكَفَى خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا كَثُرٌ And by the way, even the wordings is rhythmic, it's beautiful. And that which is little and suffices you, money-wise, is better than that which is a lot and distracts you. So having a little bit which is enough is better than having a lot which distracts. خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا كَثُرٌ وَأَلْهَى and the worst excuse is the excuse that you give at the time of death. SubhanAllah, how beautiful. The worst excuse is the one you give at the time of death. Why did I do this? Why did I? You make your excuses at the time of death. And the most evil of regrets is the regret on the day of judgment. What use will it be? As Allah says in the Quran, that يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ on that day, every man will feel. But of what use is that feeling on that day? And there are those people who don't come to Jumu'ah at all, except on rare occasions. So the Prophet is criticizing them. And there are those who don't do dhikr of Allah, except again, abandonedly or not enthusiastically. 
and the wor- or of the worst of all sins is a lying tongue. Of the worst of all sins is a lisan al kadhub the guy who's always lying. This is of the worst people. And the best richness is the richness of the heart. Wa khayrul ghina, ghina nafs. If your heart feels rich, that's the best richness. Wa khayru zad at taqwa. And the best of all, azad does not have an English word. Azad is what a traveler would take for the journey. It's the, the backpack, like you, you know, what you have for the journey. There is no one English word. Some say provisions, but the zad is what you take for your journey. So the Prophet is saying the best baggage is a taqwa. وَرَأْسُ hikmah, And the pinnacle of wisdom is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the pinnacle of wisdom, to have the fear of Allah. And the best thing that settles in the heart is yaqeen. To settle in the heart, yaqeen, that is the best thing. And khamr, which is alcohol, is jima'ul ithim, or one can say the mother of all evil. Or all evil comes through khamr. The one who drinks, everything else follows after that. And Wallahi, this society knows this and everybody knows this as well. The amount of problems and pain and suffering that drinking uh, produces. And women are the forebringers of shaitan for men. Meaning getting involved too much with them will bring shaitan to uh, the men. And the worst of all income is the income of riba. The worst of all income is the income of riba. And the worst thing to eat is the property of an orphan. And the lucky person or the fortunate person is the one who learns from the mistakes of others. So if somebody does something wrong, a sin, you should learn from that mistake. And the hadith goes on and it's very beautiful here, but again, so much is, um, uh, has to go on. But uh, one of the things that I want to mention, so, and he said, and this, for example, this phrase here is in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, to curse a believer is a sin and to fight him is kufr. And to eat of his flesh is a ma'asiyah, backbiting. And the sanctity of his money is like the sanctity of his blood. Meaning to steal his property and to take from it is just like killing him. And whoever asks for forgiveness, Allah will forgive. And whoever controls his anger, Allah will reward. And whoever is patient at a calamity, Allah will give him better than what was taken away. And whoever wants to show off, Allah will show, meaning punishment through him. Whoever wants to show off, Allah will show through him. And whoever is patient, Allah will give him more. And then he concluded, Allahumma firli wa li ummati, O Allah forgive me and my ummah, O Allah forgive me and my ummah, O Allah forgive me and my ummah. And then he said, Astaghfirullah li wa lakum, which is how khutbahs are ended. May I uh, ask Allah for forgiveness for me and for all of you. Now it's a beautiful narration which kind of gives us a mini, if you like, highlight into the uh, khutbas of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What else happened during those 20 days? So this happened on the first day. What else happened during those 20 days? Lots of incidents. We'll talk about some of them today and we'll continue later on. Of the things that happened that are of a political nature, he sent Khalid ibn al-Walid with a few hundred of the Sahaba on a mini expedition to one of the neighboring tribes uh, in that region of Tabuk in a neighboring small area called Daumat al-Jandal. Daumat al-Jandal, which in our time is in the modern Saudi province of Al Jauf, and there's a city there called Skaka. I know it's a strange name, but that's what is the name is Skaka. S K A K A. You can look it up on Google Maps. Skaka. This city of Skaka is where this expedition took place of Dawmat al Jandal. It is up north, close to the Syrian. Uh, border in our time. So uh, Saudi Arabia, as you know, all the way north is, is connected to Syria. So that region of Al Jauf, that is the northernmost province of the modern country of Saudi Arabia. The north, one of the most northern cities, is the city of Skaka. So this is where Khalid ibn al-Walid went, and there was a, a tribe there, a very famous tribe by the name of Kinda. And their name has come up before. It's a very one of the largest tribes. They originate in Yemen. 
but one branch of them went up north, and so they're now living next to uh, Syria. And the tribe of Kinda was a Christian Arab tribe. The tribe of Kinda was a Christian Arab tribe, and they were one of the most prestigious tribes, and they had a strong relationship with Heraclius, with the Caesar of Rome. And they were a, uh, a tribe that were known for their uh, bravery and their warriorship, and also one of the few tribes whose chieftain was called a king, a malik. And this is, as we know, in the Arabs was rare to have a king and a kingdom. But the Kinda was one of the few tribes that they would call their chieftain the king, and it would go from father to son, and he was considered to be a king. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Khalid, and he said that you will find the chieftain, and the chieftain's name is rather strange for our tongues, it is Ukaydir, Ukaydir. That was his name, King Ukaydir, Al Malik Ukaydir. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Khalid and Walid, you will find Ukaydir away from his entourage in the midst of some cows. Like a king away from his army in the midst of some cows. Like a bizarre scenario. And the Prophet told Khalid and Walid, you will find Ukaydir. Basically, you will be able to capture him away from his army, away from in the midst of he's gonna be with cows. And subhanAllah, the books of Sirah mentioned that it so happened. On one evening that Ukaidir was in his palace when his herd of cows and bulls came to the door of the palace and began barging against the door all night long, just smacking their heads on the door. And his wife got fed up and said, you have to stop this commotion and racket. How are we going to go to sleep? So Ukaidir said, okay, I will take care of it. So he went down with three or four of the servants and he thought that they must be hungry. So in the middle of the night or before Fajr, he just, he himself with some of the servants, not his army, went to take the, the cows out to graze in the land and one thing leads to another and lo and behold, Khalid ibn al-Walid with 350 sahaba comes upon the king Ukaidir in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of cows and some of his servants. That's all it was. And so uh, he is captured and he is brought in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, Ukaidir agrees to, uh, he doesn't convert uh, at the time. It is said that he converted later on, but at this time he does not convert. He agrees to pay the jizya. He agrees to break off the relationship with the Romans and to pay the jizya to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to not attack the Muslims. So this was one of the big successes of the Battle of Tabuk. And to follow that success up, three, four other such relationships were done with the northernmost tribes of the Arabs. So what in effect happened was the northern barrier was sealed against the Romans. And perhaps this was the greatest political wisdom for why Allah willed the Battle of Tabuk. That there's a huge army sitting in Tabuk and people like Ukaidir and others cannot fight it against it single-handedly. So when they see this massive army, Basically, all of the northern tribes, and the number of are mentioned, we have not heard their names before, and I'm not going to bore you with the names, but a number of northern tribes basically decided it's in their best interest to break off relationships with Rome and to pay the jizya to the Prophet And when they were camped at Tabuk, uh, Ukaidir sent a lot of gifts. It is also said, by the way, that Khalid captured much Ghanima when he captured Ukaidir. So he had uh, some small entourage and he had all of the cows and flocks and whatnot. So it is said that he captured uh, that as Ghanima. But then Ukaidir sent some gifts afterwards to show that I am now a loyal, you know, uh, not a servant because he's not a Muslim, but a vassal, like a, an ally, right? A loyal ally. And he, he sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is said, a, 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 a hulla, a shawl, that the likes of which they had never seen. And there was even gold threaded onto the shawl. Gold threading. And the Prophet wore this beautiful, magnificent shawl. And the Sahaba were just amazed at the shawl. How beautiful it was. According to one narration, they're like walking around. They haven't seen anything like it. And again, we need to understand that the poverty of the Arabs at that time, especially the Hijaz, and he realized they didn't even have water other than Zamzam. How can they have civilization, right? You need to understand the Sahaba, are Im, the Arabs at the time, the Hijazi Arabs are importing everything. 
from Yemen and from Syria and from everything. They don't even, as we have said from the beginning, they don't have their own script. They don't have libraries. They don't have two-story buildings. They don't have their own currency. The currency they're using is Roman currency and they're not Rome. Or they're using uh, uh, the, 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 the drachms of, of, of the, um, uh, the, 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 the Kisra, the Persians, right? So they're using Persian and Roman currency. They don't have their own currency. So you have to understand, they are seeing now what we would say is, let's say, Italian tailor-made suit, right? Coming to uh, some village in the middle of nowhere, they've never, this is amazed. And they're walking around it. So the Prophet said, أَتَعْجَبُونَ مِنْ هَذَا You are impressed with this? فَوَاللَّهِ لَمَنْدِيلُ سَعْدِ بْنِ مُعَادْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ the handkerchief that Sa'd ibn Mu'ad has in Jannah is more precious than this entire shawl that you are uh, seeing. So, uh, the, it is also said that he established a treaty with another king of the Arab tribes there, the king of Ayla, and the king of Ayla also sent him gifts, and uh, many other tribes as well, the local tribes of the uh, province of Tabuk, all basically had peace treaties with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the final incident that we'll mention for today is one of my favorite stories of the seerah. And in fact, I have said this story two and a half or three years ago. But mashallah, since all of you take such good notes and since you remember everything, then uh, we might as well just refresh your notes, inshallah, and redirect you to the story that has already been said. But it is one of my favorite stories, really, of the seerah. It's such a beautiful story uh, that took place at Tabuk. So the Prophet ﷺ, and, and this story is uh, found once again in the Musnad books. The, the books of seerah just reference it. This is one of those things you actually find more of the details in the books of hadith. So it is actually found in the Musnad Imam Ahmad in volume 24. So we will read it directly. Hadith number 15,655. So, uh, and this is the famous incident of Heraclius quizzing the Prophet ﷺ through a messenger. And let us go straight to the hadith. Uh, that there was a man from the tribe of At-Tanukh. So he's called the Tanukhi. The one from the tribe of At-Tanukh. We don't even know his name. Uh, that used to live in Hims. Hims is, of course, Syria. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free that land from the tyrant that is currently occupying it and from the tyrannical forces that are fighting within it. There is a tyrant on top and then there are tyrannical extremists on the bottom. May Allah azza wa jal free them min bayni farthin wa damin, insha'Allah ta'ala. So, uh, Sa'id ibn Abi Rashid said, I met the uh, Tanukhi, uh, the one whom Hiraqal sent uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hims. And... He was a neighbor of mine in the vicinity, neighbor of mine, very old, having reached almost a hundred years of age or close to that. So I asked him, can't you tell me, meaning please tell me, of the letter that Hiraqal sent to the Prophet wasallam? Tell me the story. So this Tabi'i, he's not a Sahabi, his name is Sa'id ibn Abi Rashid. So he said, I met this man, uh, and in one, another version he says, I met him in the church of him. So he went to the church to meet this man, this At-Tanukhi. So, uh, and I said, can you tell me directly the story of, the Pro of, of Hiraqal sending you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? So the Tanukhi said, yes, I will tell you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to Tabuk. So he sent Dihya al-Kalbi to Hiraqal. So this is the second letter to Hiraqal. He's already sent a letter to him before. And I have talked about that with, with Abu Sufyan, back and forth with Abu Sufyan. That's the first letter. Then this is a second letter that he sends him, right? And when the messenger, uh, meaning Dihya, came to uh, Hiraqal, Hiraqal called the Batariqa and the Qisis of Rome, the Batariqa is the patriarchs. Batariqa, the patriarchs. And the Qisis, the, uh, the priests. So the priests and the patriarchs of Rome, he called them all together. And he locked the door. And he said to, this is now the elite of the religious clergymen. And he said to them, you have seen the status of this man and his affairs, where he has reached. Meaning, since he has sent me the first letter, now he's conquered so much, look at now his affairs. And he has now sent me a letter, inviting me to one of three things. 
And this shows us it's a second letter because the first letter which is recorded in Bukhari doesn't have this. That's the first letter. This is the second letter. And he's invited me to one of three things. Number one, I either follow his religion. Or number two, what will be the second choice? Give money. Give him money and we keep our land. Or number three, we fight him. These are the standard three choices. And Herakl says, You know from what we have read of our scriptures that he will eventually control what is underneath our feet. So why don't we follow him and his religion now? So Hiraqil is offering to convert. Or if you refuse this, then at least let's have peace with him and give him the money. Meaning let's not go to war because he is a true prophet. So when they heard this, they all bolted and they rushed to the door, attempting to get out and tell the people that Hiraqil is willing to give up Christianity. Now remember, Hiraqil is supposed to be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a religious figurehead as well. I mean, to this day, in the Anglican church, the king or the queen technically is still the head of the church, right? This is how it was. This is now technically, back then, this was like a God-given right. As the head of the, the, the political system, you are appointed by God to defend the church. That's what they would understand. So to suggest that I'm going to become a Muslim, this is too much for them. So they rushed to the door, they found it uh, bolted. So then he said uh, that, oh, and then they said to him, are you telling us to give up Christianity? or to become servants to a Bedouin coming from the Hijaz, Abid al-Arabi and Ja'a min al-Hijaz. You want us, the Roman civilization, to become uh, servants to, this, uh, to the Bedouins from Hijaz. So when he saw that they would not give up their position, he then said to them, this was only a test. I am trying and testing you to see how firm you are. So he got rid of them. Then Hiraqal called one of the Arabs of his entourage, of the Nasara al-Arab. And he said to me, find for me a man who is Arabi lisan He speaks Arabic and he is a good messenger to memorize what he's going to say. I want to send a book to or a message or a risala to this man. So this Arab bought me the Tanukhi to Hiraqal. Clear now, right? So the middleman basically brings the Tanukhi. Here is a guy you can trust. So he brings me to Hiraqal. And Hiraqal gave me a message, a parchment, you know, the, 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 the Risala. And he said, take this to that man. And whatever you forget of his speech and conversation, just pick and memorize three things. The whole conversation you can forget, just memorize for me three things. Number one, number one, ah, so see or, or uh, check, does he mention the letters that he wrote to me? The previous letters, does he mention that? Does he mention the letters that he has written to me? Number two, when he reads this letter of mine, see if he will mention anything to do with night and darkness. So there's some test question in the letter, right? If he reads the letter, just see if he's going to mention the night or the darkness. And number three, see on his back, is there something that causes you to be alarmed, something different that should not be on the back of any man? See on his back. So from this we learn that there are three signs that are mentioned in the classical books of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Tanukhi said, I went to his book, oh, sorry, with his Risala until I arrived at Tabuk. Now, Tabuk is literally one day's journey from the Syrian border of our times. Literally, I mean, in our times, it's like an hour's drive in the car. It's used of the northernmost place. So, you know, the, the Risala Dihya goes up, then this man comes down. Okay, so he comes and he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Tabuk. And he was sitting amongst all of his companions at, at the well of Tabuk. So that's where they were, that they're at the well of Tabuk. So when I saw all of them there, I went up and I said, where is your leader? So they pointed and he said, ha huwa that he is over there. And this demonstrates that the Prophet was not wearing garments and clothes that made him 
stand up from the rest of the crowd. So you cannot be, all of them are dressed similarly. So which one is the leader? So they pointed. So he went, uh, I, he said, I went walking towards him until I sat down in front of him and I gave him the book. Now, well, to I gave him the uh, book. So he put it aside. He didn't read the book. He, di he didn't read the letter. He put it aside. And he said, where are you from? I said, I am from the tribe of Tanukh. I am from Tanukh. So he said, why don't you embrace Islam, the Hanifiyya, the Milla of your father Ibrahim. You're an Arab. Your father is Ibrahim. Embrace Islam. And that is the way of your father Ibrahim. So the Tanukh, he said, I am an ambassador of a nation right now. And my people have their religion. He's also a Christian. And I will not embrace another religion as an ambassador of mine. And I will go back and think about this matter. And that's therefore some people say he embraced Islam later on. And some people say he remained a Christian. And one version mentions he was in a church. Another version doesn't mention that. So there's a bit of an ikhtilaf. Did the Tanukhi embrace Islam or not? There's a bit of a, uh, a controversy over that. But basically he said, I'm an ambassador. And I represent the Roman Empire right now. And it's not appropriate for me to convert as an ambassador. Some perverted logic he has, right? So the Prophet ﷺ laughed at this. فَضَحِكَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And he recited Surah Al-Qasas verse 56. You do not guide those whom you love, but rather Allah guides those whom He uh, pleases. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, you person of Tanukh. He hasn't opened the letter yet. O oh, you person of Tanukh. I wrote a letter to the Kisra of Persia. And he ripped my letter apart so Allah will rip his kingdom apart and I wrote my letter to you to the uh, Najashi and he ripped it apart so Allah will rip his kingdom apart I'll explain this in a while I know what you're all thinking and I wrote my letter to your companion meaning Heracl Heraclius so he kept it safe. And so people will continue to see his strength, Heraclius' strength, as long as there is some good to life. Meaning his kingdom will remain for a long time. Now pause here. Uh, we all know the story of Kisra and he tore it up. As for the story of Najashi, we need to realize that this is not the Najashi that is the first Najashi. The first Najashi died, and our Prophet prayed salah over him. Then the Prophet sent another letter to his son, and his son tore that letter up. And the magnificent kingdom of the Abyssinian Habasha dissolved after that point in time. And we still have to this day their remnants and their civilization and their heritage, but the kingdom dissolved. There was a civil war after the death of our Najashi. And the son basically started the civil war with another faction. And it's as the Prophet ﷺ said, that he tore my letter up, so Allah will tear his kingdom up. And your companion, Heraclius, preserved my letter, so Allah will preserve his kingdom as long as there is good in the people. So the Tanukhi said, this is the first of the three. You understand? He mentions letter. The first of the three. And he said, I took out an arrow from my swiver. Uh, what do you call the thing again? Huh? Quiver. I call it swiver. See? It shows, it shows you have never had some real hunting experience. You should take me one day hunting. So from my uh, quiver, and I carved out on the parchment, meaning so I don't forget. So they don't have pen and ink. So he's actually taking the arrowhead, and he's carving into leather. Whatever he wants to carve, like the first point is done. Okay, so he did this. Then, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi So I said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is saying, I said to him, Who is your secretary that will read to you? Who reads? Meaning read the letter. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Muawiyah. And Muawiyah is one of the Kuttab al wahi He's one of the people who would read and write the revelation and be an ambassador or a scribe. So Muawiyah. So Muawiyah was called... Muawiyah then reads the letter and inside the letter there was a question Heraclius is sending to the Prophet. Clear? Right? So in that letter, 
Heraclius is saying, you pretend to invite me to a heaven that is as broad as the heaven and the earth. Jannatan arduha samawatu wal ard. You are saying there is a Jannah that is as big as the heavens and earth that is prepared for the muttaqin. So, if that is the case, that heaven is as big as the heaven and earth, where then is hell? This is the question, the trick question. Don't look at me, it's Heraclius, right? This is the trick question. If heaven is so big that it takes up Jannat and Audwaha Samawatu Wal Ard, right? Where is hell? So our Prophet said, Subhanallah, wa aina laylu ida akbal al nahar. Subhanallah, where does the night go when the day comes? So what just happens here? Question two. Right? So the Tanukhi says, this is the second. And later on, he takes out his arrow and he scribes on his leather parchment what he needs to scribe down that. Uh, I, the second thing is done. Then, when he finished reading the letter, the Prophet wasallam said, You are an ambassador and you have a right over us as an ambassador. Uh, and if we had something to give you, we would have given you. But right now we are in travel and I don't have anything. So he's ex excusing himself that ambassadors deserve gifts. You know, it is the nature of all, uh, you know, customs of the world that when the ambassador comes, you give the ambassador a gift, right? This is the nature of all political, you know, realities. And the Prophet ﷺ is conforming to those political customs. There's nothing wrong with conforming to political custom. But he is saying, we are now in a safar. And we don't have anything to give you. I'm sorry, I can't give you a gift because I'm not at home now. And this shows us the poverty of the Sahaba and of the people that they don't have even these gifts. So somebody stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, I will give him a gift. And he went to his tent and he came back and he gave him a yellow garment, Hulla Safra, and he gifted it to me. So the narrator says, Who was the man who gave you the gift? So the Tanukhi says, It was Uthman ibn Affan. It was Uthman ibn Affan. That when the Prophet excused himself, I don't have anything, Uthman felt bad. He said, I will give him on your behalf. So Uthman gave one of his own garments to the uh, Tanukhi. So the Prophet then said, who amongst you will host this man for the night? So one of the Ansar stood up and he said, I will host him. So I stayed with the uh, man for the night. Then when it was time for me to go back, because he's a messenger, he's going to go back the next day. So uh, I stood up to leave. And I went out from the majlis and the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ta'al ya akha tanukh. Come here, O man from tanukh. Come here, O person of tanukh. So I came rushing towards him until when I was standing in front of him, he pulled back his garment and he said, come and look at what your Lord or your master has told you to look at. And so the tanukh, said, I went behind him and I saw a Khatam, a seal in between the two shoulder blades, like a uh, like a circular, uh, you know, um, uh, ball or seal over there. And we learn from other traditions that it was a type of hair of an unusual color. We learn from yet other traditions it was as small as a pigeon's egg, which is literally like this: a pigeon's egg. It's a small thing, and it was perfectly in between the shoulder blades, and it was a physical uh, hair, growth of hair, in a small manner, in a color that is not typical. The color, some say green, some say other colors. It's a hair that is an unusual color, uh, you know, a color that is beautiful to look at, and it is in between the katife or the, the shoulder blades of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, I went back having all three of the questions answered and this is a beautiful narration you must admit it's a, such a is one of my favorite stories of the man from Tanukh and what happens to the man of Tanukh and this also occurs in the battle of uh, Tabuk and inshallah ta'ala with that we conclude today's halaqa and um, before I